some things to be aware of today. We are, uh, Pastor Larry has us in John 21. Um, go to John 21 in your Bibles because I think it's important that you uh, kind of see where that is. Um, I would say to you today, uh, I think Barb Salyer is going to be kind enough to read for us um, in a moment. Um, I should have thought of introducing her earlier to got her to sit down earlier. So, <laughs> so in John 21, some things that you just need to be aware of. So in Luke chapter 5, um, Luke records as Jesus is about to invite uh, Peter and his brother Andrew to be a disciple. He challenges them to do an unorthodox fishing methodology. They came in from a night of fishing. Uh, so, so see this picture at the Sea of Galilee. Most of the native fishermen would go out uh, at nighttime and they would take a lantern and they would hold it at the end of the boat or they would attach it to a pole that stood up and that light would attract the fish. And then they had what's called casting nets. Um, it's a net that when they cast it, it had some rock weights tied to it and, and it would go out and the fish would come up toward the light. They would cast it out and they would capture as they pulled on it, the net would close and they'd pull the fish up, right? That was the, the for commercial fishermen, that was kind of their standard way of fishing. And uh, in Luke 5, you'll, you'll read the story that they've been out fishing all night, caught nothing. Jesus says, well, go out and cast your, your line out again or your nets out again. And they said, well, we didn't catch anything, but we'll listen to you anyway. And they caught a load so big they couldn't get the, it in without another boat helping. Well, this story today, is, as far as getting ready to read it, will be very similar, um, but it's different this time. And so, uh, so it's interesting how Jesus calls them to ministry with a really neat fish story, and then he concludes his time with them with a very neat fish story. So I just want you to recognize that uh, there's, a, uh, there's a lot of interesting and fascinating ways that God approaches us. And we sometimes miss those, uh, particularly when we read stories, which is why my intention as your pastor is to teach scripture right through every Sunday in order, uh, because I think we'll learn it better versus skipping all around as the lecturer does for most Protestant denominations. And then we say, well, I didn't remember that story in Luke, right? So as we study it more, we'll be able to relate these real nuances of, of the gospel or of all of all scripture. Uh, the other thing I want you to do is to recognize that Pastor Murray's theme was um, when we don't know what to do, sometimes we do the familiar. When we don't know what to do, sometimes we do the familiar. And I want you to appreciate that uh, for a lot of us, that's what happens. And so um, later on in the lesson, we're going to take you to Proverbs chapter 26. Um, yeah, 26 and also the second Peter. And, and we're going to talk about something that's, that's, uh, the Bible doesn't hide much from us. Okay. We're going to talk about a dog returning to its vomit. And, uh, you know, that's kind of one of those things people go, is that in the Bible? Well, yeah, it's actually in the Old Testament, New Testament. So, uh, we're going to go to both of those. Okay. So Barb, if you're ready, please. I'm reading from the Living Bible. And thank you, by the way, for reading today. Fire and the fish were frying over it, and there was bread. Bring some. 
some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went out and dragged the net ashore. But his count, by his count, there were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. And none of us dared ask him if he really was the Lord, for we were quite sure of it. Then Jesus went around serving us the bread and the fish. This was the third time Jesus had appeared to us since his return from the dead. Thank you. So, uh, an interesting story. So, tell me what you think is going on in Peter's mind as to why all this occurs. I mean, why does he say, I'm going to go fishing? Deja vu. Deja vu all over again. Yes, ma'am. It's like eating comfort food. It's what he knows. It's what he knows? Yeah. Hey, Joe. Yes. I've got a question. Okay. Why did they call Thomas the twin? Uh, because he had a twin brother. Uh, seriously? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. He's, not, he's not mentioned in the story, uh, but apparently his family called him Didymus. And, and so I, I don't know... Uh, I'm not sure what the origin of that Hebrew or Aramaic name is, but yes. But again, it's never mentioned. Twins or twins. That makes sense. Um, or even whether the ten twins live. Okay. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I, I, yeah, Pete, uh, uh, Kenny. I don't fish fish. I fish fish. Okay. I, and I'm sorry, ladies. I don't mean this to be ser uh, sexually stereotypical, but. I kind of get what that means, so explain that to those who don't understand. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but when I go fishing and the bob would be going like yeah. this, I pick up a bob. And Paul said, I drew scared of this. There you go. That's uh, you don't hear no honey, honey, yes, right? Yeah, I, yeah I, I get it. So, uh, yeah, I, I want you to get Peter's mind here. Um, so this is the, this scripture says, this is the third time that Jesus appeared to him. So Jesus appears and he leaves. So they're still processing everything that's going on. Don't ever underappreciate the fact that, you know, the rest of the story, right? And because you know, the rest of the story, you look at a character like this and say, duh, why doesn't Peter get it? But if you were living in Peter's shoes, there would be still a lot of confusion in your mind. Jesus is saying things and then he disappears, right? Was he coming back? What are we supposed to do? Do we wait for him? You know, you're not sure what to do. And so appreciate that. So why fishing? And Kathleen's already said it. It's familiar, right? It, it was his livelihood. Um, there's a lot of people when they get under pressure, they do some interesting things. So here's what I want you to recognize on your outline. What do you do when you're under stress? What do you do when you're under stress? So um, an executive leadership coach once told me that, and it's proven to be very, very true. Um, when you can begin to identify stress in your life, you can begin to identify the stressors in your life. When you can identify two really methodologies for you to think about, this would be helpful to all of you. Um, there are really two ways to look at stress and recognize it. One is the physiological response of the body. Okay. The second one is the emotional response that you go through. If you can begin to identify this is what the stressors are, but this is the stress and this is how it manifests itself then you can quickly begin to, to control some of that and you can also begin to lessen its effect. Um, any of you in the medical profession would, would recognize and be able to probably expound in great detail how uh, stress can affect you negatively, okay? Particularly over long periods of time. Uh, so I, I just want you to appreciate that if you can begin to identify. So for me, uh, stress, particularly Emotional stress will result in my jaws clenching. Uh, I will have some tightness around the lower part of my <laughs> neck. Okay. And when that happens, I know, okay, 
I'm being stressed, and what am I doing about it? How am I going to react? Okay. Uh, but you have to be cognizant of it and aware of it. So those of you that lead people or manage people, that's very helpful because a lot of times what will happen is we have stress, we react, and then we are uh, kind of sorry for the way we reacted. Not that we threw open knives or shot bullets at somebody, but, but we end up going, she was not going to go back and kind of fix what I just did because I didn't handle it, right? And so I, I just want you to recognize those are two things that will be helpful for you. Now, what does that do with, what does that have to do with our Christian faith? The same thing. Um, when you are walking your faith, you're going to be times when you go, what do I do? You're going to be like Peter. The familiar for me is that I'm going to step back in the way I've operated for years before I was a Christian, right? And, and that means that I'm going to um, threaten I'm going to say the wrong things. I'm going to think the wrong things. I'm going to act or react the wrong way. And, and if you can begin to understand these are the things that cause this, then maybe um, maybe that could be helpful to you as well. So um, again, I think I just want to touch on that because that may be helpful as you begin to develop your maturity as a Christian. Now, while things change, we crave some things. We crave some things, and I want you to, to recognize that when you're under stress, you will crave some things, right? Um, you may not realize it till later. So anybody care to share what you may crave when you're under stress? Food. Okay. Um, it can be. And, and so what we're going to title that is just comfort. Kathleen mentioned it a minute ago. Okay. We, we, uh, it, it'll be comfort food. Um, uh, for a, a little baby, for our son, when he was real, it was a, it was a nano, right? It was a little blanket or something, you know, that he had to have. Um, it could be anything that comforts you. For some of you, it may be uh, watching uh, uh, an old movie, right? Um, NASCAR. Yeah, it could be uh, it could be a sport. It could be in Peter's case, I'm going to go fishing. Okay. Solitude. Uh, yeah, solitude for some of you, absolutely. So uh, comfort is something that we will often crave when we are under uh, duress or stress, okay? Um, another thing is some of you, it will be connection. And here's what I'm just having to warn you about a little bit with connection. Make sure that if that is the way you uh, placate the issues that you're under with stress or, or with, uh, with, with pressure, uh, duress, um, make sure you're connecting the right thing, okay? Uh, so uh, some people will, they want to connect, but they don't really want to do it in a personal way, so they'll do it uh, via uh, social media. And that connection is usually not always comfort, okay? That's what's happening with, with teenagers, particularly teenage girls, is um, under stress or duress or pressure, they will uh, connect. They, they, they don't have the confidence or the comfort or the ability, um, maturity in some cases, to connect with somebody one-on-one -on -one that could really help them. So instead, they, they feel the need to connect. So they connect by social media. And social media is a landmine, okay? You could be walking and everything's fine. All of a sudden, you step on something, blows up in front of you. And so uh, the connection part is an important concept you got to connect to the right source and the right things now as your sunday school teacher i would tell you under stress duress pressure uh whatever you may be feeling um i would always encourage you to connect with god in prayer right um yes ma'am i'm stressed out i just sit close my eyes and just pray and it calms me down. Yep, sit and pray, absolutely. It, 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 it definitely calms you down. So connection could be that source. But again, be careful what you connect with, okay? Um, if you are in a, 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 a pressure relationship with somebody else and you are under stress and you think, oh, well, I'll give them a call and see what they think. If every time you get off the phone with that person, you're upset, well, guess what you just did? You just doubled the pressure, right? So be careful how you connect with that. Um, another thing is possibly uh, for, for many of us, we will do what's called uh, safe space. 
Okay, and that looks differently for everybody. Uh, for some of you, uh, it could be that if you're working in, in a, a, a place of business, you go to your office and you close the door, right? That's a safe space. Even though it may not be very long, you feel safe, right? Um, um, I, I knew a guy once that I had to coach on my team. <clears throat> when he was under stress, he would sit behind his desk and when someone would come in, he wouldn't stand up. It was his way. You, you get it? When, when I sit down behind a desk, I have protection. It's like a fence. It's like a fort around it, right? So it's a safe space. And so you can identify what your safe space is. For some of you, it's a walk, right? For some of you, it's I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna go get, go drive somewhere. I'm just gonna go and look around and kind of be depressed. Uh, wherever your safe space is, you, you should have one. You should have a couple. And, and it's nothing wrong with doing that when you're under stress, duress, or pressure. Okay? Um, a safe space, though, is something that is different for all of us. So my, my safe spaces may not be yours. Mine is a 36 by 40 woodworking shop. That is a safe space. I hide there a lot because sometimes it's not always safe in other spaces. <laughs> I'm being really good at sitting over here and not saying anything. And that is a good thing. And then, and then, I have thoughts going on up here. <laughs> so, and finally, uh, the familiar. So, so what I want you to remember is that, that sometimes, uh, like Peter, we do the familiar when we're under stress. Okay? Um, you, you know, you, you have an occupation that you're comfortable with. You're good at, you go do that. I'm going to work, okay? Um, I'm, I'm going to go to my shop. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in and, and, and bake something. Whatever that safe space is for you, the familiar is helpful. So these are some things, though, that you need to begin to recognize in your faith walk. You need to do the same thing, okay? What does that look like for you? What gives you comfort in your faith walk? How do you connect to your faith walk? What's a safe space, space in your faith walk? And what's what's the familiar in your faith walk? If if you don't have anything that's familiar in your faith walk, then I'm going to. Um, there's an interesting word in the Bible. Some of your older texts will say to be an exhorter. Okay, to exhort. Um, that's a polite way of saying, I'm going to bust your chops, but for the right reason, right? And so that's what I want to do. I want to exhort you right now and say, if you don't have something familiar in your faith wall, then you need to develop it, okay? That's important, all right? Now, after things change, what do we do? So uh, we, we won't have time today, but if you want to, you can go to the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13, because um, a lot of times our faith is much like that story. Uh, that story is about the sower, okay? And Jesus tells a story and his disciples being thick-headed men, uh, like most of us men in here are. Um, and, and we we don't pay attention, right? And so Jesus that Jesus tells a story to a group of thousands of people, and the disciples go, what did that mean? What did that mean? And he goes, oh, boy. Uh, let me explain it to you. So the parable of the sower is about this guy who goes out seed. And some of it falls on rocky ground, okay? So sometimes the word of God falls in our life. Things are tough. <laughs> We're focused on the wrong things. We're caught up in the wrong things. And God's word just, it doesn't, doesn't even germinate, right? And then some falls on ground that is along the path. And, and so that seed gets sown. Well, the path is a hard ground, right? It's hard ground. And it doesn't really germinate there either. Sometimes our lives are hard. We're hard, our hearts are hard, and it doesn't hit very well. And then there's other times that the seed falls um, on ground that it germinates, but the roots don't go deep enough. And so then when the pressure happens, when the drought occurs, when it gets hot, the plant dies, right? And sometimes when life gets hard, uh, our faith just goes away. It just evaporates in front of us because things are hard, right? And I, I don't have a deep faith. And then he used the example of 60 or 100 times, depending on translation, that if seed falls on good ground, it germinates and it, it just it, it, it produces so much. That being the case, 
after things change, what do we do? Which one of those are we, right? And so um, you, you've all heard of, a, of adrenaline. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's one of those uh, micro hormones that uh, it goes into the body just so absolutely quickly. We're talking about nanoseconds. It, it causes a physiological response in the body. And uh, mm. one of the things they call it is fight or flight, right? What adrenaline calls us fight or flight. I'm going to fight or I'm going to run. Uh, you know, my body's ready to react. And so one of the things to remember is that when things change in our life, um, it doesn't have to be the, the death of a spouse. I mean, that's huge, right? But it could just be the rejection of a friend. It could be the frustration of someone not hearing your voice, right? Not that they didn't hear you on the phone. You hear me now. But, I mean, you're saying something to them and you recognize they're not hearing you, right? That can cause micro uh, events, they call them, micro events of, of, of adrenaline, right? It, it's not enough to, to make you get up and run the marathon without any help, but it's, it's, it's enough to make you, your body stress and, and enough for you to have some, some, some anxiousness, right? So after things change, what do we do? A couple of things. We, we can freeze, okay? Um, and, and when I say freeze, I'm not talking about freezing the place, I'm talking but I am, right? I'm not talking physically freezing as much as sometimes in our faith world, mm -hmm. something doesn't go well and we just kind of stop. I'm not sure if I get this. I'm not sure if God's real. Um, how come nothing's going like it's supposed to? I'm a mm -hmm. believer. How come it's not going like I thought it was? So sometimes we kind of freeze in our response. Um, another thing that we do is we bounce around. Now, um, that that may be a, a little uh, hard, but another way to say that is we could also fade away, all right? Um, now, when we talk about bouncing around or fading away, um, sometimes in our faith walk, when things aren't going like we think, we decide, well, that, that's not right anyway. I'll just put it here. And, and so you go online and you'll you'll see a YouTube or a Google search and it'll kind of take you down a pathway that's really off track, right? It, it may not be that noticeable, but be careful that you don't go off track, that you don't fade away from what your faith is really based on. Um, now, some move forward. Um, and and that sounds like the right answer, doesn't it? Move forward. Yeah. And that's the point I want to make to you is, um, and, and when I say type A's, if you ladies look around at men, shame on you because women are type A's too, okay? So, so don't be sexually stereotyped the wrong way. We are practicing wokeism here, and us men, we can be... Uh, we can be wrong too once in a while. <laughs> Close your ears. So uh, move forward. Sometimes we move forward, but when you move forward, make sure you're moving in the wrong in the right direction, like Beverly's saying, but also make sure that you're following the right path. Okay. Follow the right voice. Right voice isn't always your Sunday school teacher. The right voice is scripture. Okay. Um, yes, ma'am. It can be wrong to move forward if God wants you to sit in the wilderness. Perfect. Perfect. Yes. I mean, remember, a great example of that is before Jesus' public ministry actually started, the Spirit took him into the wilderness for 40 days. Okay? I mean, 40 days is a long time. Very symbolic, like we talked about in, in here. But um, it's, it's an important thing. So moving forward can be good, but it may not be time growth. So be careful with that. And then finally, um, the other one is we can revert back. So we can revert back to the old self. Okay, to the old self. And uh, we kind of have to be careful with that. In fact, um, the reverting back is a segue into the next item on your, on your outline. And that is... Uh, why can man be guilty of Proverbs 26, um, 
11 and 2 Peter uh, 2 9. And so, um, let's see, Barb, you have the Living Bible. Would you mind going to uh, Proverbs 26 11 for me, please? And uh, I'll grab uh, 2 Peter 2 9 and 12 um, and, and read it really quickly for you. Um, and, and Peter is talking about false teachers and misdirection. He's talking about people who aren't uh, adhering to the gospel. He said, and if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. This is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the flesh and despise authority. And then uh, uh, let me keep going a little bit further. And, and these people are springs of water and driven by a storm. Darkest blackness is reserved for them. He's talking about those who revert away from their faith. He's talking about those who let go of their faith, right? Uh, for they have empty, boastful words, and by appealing to the lustful desires of the flesh, they entice people who are just escaping from those who live in air. They promise them freedom while they themselves are sl slaves of depravity, for people are slaves to whatever has mastered them. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off being the worth to begin. So Peter's warning us in our faith walk. It's okay. We, we sometimes we sometimes slip backwards, but if you revert completely back, you're worse off than before because now you're going, well, God can't be real, right? I've decided that he can't be real, so you made that decision. Um, it would have been far better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than have known it and then turned their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them, the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit. And a sow that is washed returns to her wallowing in the mud. Okay. Some of you uh, have shown uh, hogs at, at the fair, right? And you know that when you wash them, you get your board ready and your stick ready and you get them into the ring. Because if you delay, they are going to lay down and get dirty again. You got to repeat the cycle, right? Everybody knows that about hogs. So that's what he's saying. Barb? Uh, Proverbs 26, 11, please. And the dog returns to his vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. Yeah, so that, doesn't that just sound so gross? But we've seen it probably if you've had dogs, <laughs> and you kind of get it, right? So why can a man be guilty of this? Yeah. So why can men and women be guilty of this? So here's what you have to remember is that darkness, sin, lies. It's our natural inclination. Uh, man's heart, my heart, your heart, if you're being serious about it, is naturally inclined to not be in line with godly intentions. I mean, I, I'm guilty of that, right? That, that's the sin of Adam and the sin of Eve, right? They had it all perfect, and they kind of gave it away because they wanted to follow after their heart, not God's heart. And so man's heart is naturally that way. We are, we are very naturally that way. And so we have to be careful because it is easy for us to revert back. Okay. Now, uh, we're going to run out of time here, but we'll make sure you understand this. Uh, Peter even says it uh, in 1 Peter, and it's throughout the Gospels. Jesus even says it. Um, you know, our salvation once you sincerely made that salvation, it's once and for all, okay? It's once and for all. But sometimes people think they've made a decision they really haven't, and they kind of lose that under the pressure of life. That's really bad. All of us, I'm sorry, let me talk in personal terms. I have faded away. I have fallen away at times because life is hard and sometimes things have just been hard and so sometimes my faith has weakened or wavered or, or failed maybe you have all right um so if i'm really honest with you you have right you have whether you recognize it or not so i just want to be sure you understand that as as a human being our natural inclination is not to lean toward God. That's something that has to be uh, 
It's called God's redeeming grace. God's always trying to woo us. He's always trying to get us into relationship with him. And, and we need to listen to that relationship, right? And, and the, the spirit working on us. So how can you guard against this behavior? So how can you guard against some behavior here? I'm sorry that we're just running out of time today. Um, uh, who would have known? Don't ever admit it to her, but without Stacy here, it seems like it took us longer to get ready. So but I'll, I'll never admit that to Stacy. Um, so how do you guard against this behavior? Well, I, I would always tell you light. I'm not talking about a wavelength light. I'm talking about getting yourself in line with those things that bring light into your life. Okay. Um, you can call it whatever you want. Um, you can go right into this concept of relationship. And I'm not just talking about relationship with God. I'm also talking about relationship with other people. Okay. Which is why I would always tell you that if you, if you start missing church, you're missing connection to relationships that are important. Okay. So I just encourage you to be consistent and, and constant there. But relationship with others, relationship with the right behaviors, relationship with the right habits, relationship with God, all those fall into that category of relationship. Um, I also want to remind you that um, truth is important. Okay. Um, do you remember one of the first phrases? Oh, gosh. 40 years ago, we talked about when computers were first stuff coming into the education system, and they would teach you garbage in, garbage, garbage out. out, right? <laughs> garbage in, garbage out. So um, truth is really important in your life because what you, what you listen to, what you observe, what you feel uh, will often lead you in your faith walk, okay? So... Um, it's important that what you see and listen to and feel is true, right? Uh, that's very, very important. And I would tell you that, that ultimately that really begins with Scripture. That is the ultimate form of truth. Um, you know, Jesus is called the truth, and, and so that's really important. Um, I would also tell you that prayer is important. Um if you want to add the word meditate after prayer, that's perfectly fine. Okay. Um, we can go in at some time in the future that prayer and meditation are different, but, but it, both are helpful. Okay. And then also one that we often overlook is worship. Uh, for those of us that have been on the Emmaus walk, uh, worship is a, it's, it's a wonderful thing there. It, it, none of that worship is inside of a church building. Okay, so you don't have to be in the church building to worship. Um, you know, I don't know if Peter and them did, but they could have worshiped on the boat. You can worship driving down the road. You can worship listening to music. You can worship washing dishes. You can worship baking cake. You can worship anywhere, right? So worship is a time of recognizing the truth and the glory of God, right? So you don't have to do it. Um, only in now, this should be a place where we do worship, but but it doesn't have to only be here. It on right yet. If, if it's only here, if it's cool only up, here, that means you end up only worshiping uh, for brief periods of time. Okay, and and and, and what's that? Yeah, yeah. Well, and so, and sometimes that's why people say I'm a Sunday Christian. You know, they recognize. I got it all together on Sunday morning, and then all falls apart after that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I want to add fasting. I'm sorry? Uh, fasting. It, it causes you to confront your own ego. It's good. That's, that's a good point. Thank you for adding that. So, again, yes, Josh. <laughs> The word right in, in verse six has two meanings. Okay, go ahead quickly. The second one, the first one is the right side was the not normal, left side was the normal side for the principle. Good point. It also means the correct side. 
Yeah, good. Good observation. Thank you, Josh. So, so this week, I'm going to challenge you to think this way, that um, when you are experiencing pressure, hardness, stress in your life, uh, be careful that you don't, uh, as the Three Stooges would say, go off to the side. Stay, <laughs> stay on your faith, all right? Recognize that you can stay grounded even under times of pressure. You may not do it well, but you got to do it. And the way to do that is that uh, we, we want to be people who recognize that, look, as a human being, I'm inclined to work the wrong things. I'm inclined to not pay attention to God. I'm inclined to want to do it myself. I'm selfish. I'm in charge. I don't want to give control to God. And uh, when that starts happening, we, we revert away, we fade away. Don't let that happen in your faith. There's always going to be some pressure. So the last question that I asked on the bottom is, will your faith be yours or someone else's? When your faith is someone else's, you're almost guaranteed that you're going to struggle with your faith. It needs to be your faith. And if you want to visit with me anytime to, to, to understand that better, wide open to heaven. Okay? Let's go to the Lord's Prayer. Father God, thank you that... You've called us to have our own faith. You've called us under pressure, Lord, to not run away, to not fade away, not to revert away. But rather, Lord, to lean into you, to recognize relationship with the right people, with truth, with scripture, with prayer, with fasting. Those are important things in our life, Lord. Help us to do that each day that we face the stress. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good week. Don't forget, board members board meeting tomorrow night and anyone's welcome to come only board members vote